All right, here's another fun lecture capture. Epistasis. Hee-haw! Recessive, dominant, or duplicate recessive epistasis. Also known in other textbooks as complementary gene action. So let's go through these, people. All right, epistasis. One gene's allele masks the phenotype of another gene's allele. What does this sound similar to? Something masking another. Hmm, that sounds like complete dominance to me. But what is complete dominance? Complete dominance is one allele masking another allele of same gene. Right? Epistasis is one gene's allele masking the phenotype of another gene's allele. So a gene interaction. Hmm, that's what all these uh, extensions in, in this end of this chapter is dealing with. Genes affecting other genes. So one gene allele masking the phenotype of another gene allele. What the hell does that mean? Well, let's walk through these, okay? Here's the definition. Let's do each. Recessive epistasis, we are going to use coat color and Labrador retrievers as our example. We also have this crazy Bombay phenotype in the ABO blood groups. You can go ahead and look that up. It should be in our book or someplace else if you're interested. But our main pattern that we're looking for is a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 4 in the F2. Again, have we seen this ratio in any other examples that we've talked about? No, this is the pattern you're looking for. In the F2, one trait, okay? All of these are based on genotypes 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 of two genes, because that's what we're talking about, but what the phenotype looks like changes, not the genotypes. Okay, so if we have a parental, if we have a true breeding yellow lab and a true breeding black lab, remember two genes contributing to one trait, the trait being coat color, right? What color is their fur? Yellow, black. In the F1, we get all black, okay? From here, we don't know diddly. This could be complete dominance, just a regular old... Um, one gene trait, right? Can't tell anything just from the P to the F1. How about our F1 to F2? Remember, all of these come out in the F2. If you were just told F1, you don't know squat. Okay. Here's our F2. We get three different phenotypes. The black guy, a chocolate guy, and a yellow. This could look like incomplete dominance, right? This guy, if it were a one gene trait, would be the heterozygote. Looks like neither. But look, the ratios are wrong. Now, I hope you guys are doing the homework problems, and if you haven't done them, you're going to do them soon, because you're not always just going to be given 9 to 3 to 4. You might be given numbers, and then you need to convert those numbers into the ratios. Okay, so... Hmm. Make sure you know how to do that. Make sure you practice the problem. Okay, so the ratio is wrong. What would it be if it were incomplete dominance in the F2? 1 to 2 to 1. It's not. 9 to 3 to 4 is not even close to 1 to 2 to 1. Okay, so it has to be something else. In this case, this pattern, 9 to 3 to 4 is recessive epistasis. Okay, so you see that pattern, boom, you call it recessive epistasis. But what we also need to understand is what does this mean? So here's the Punnett square, and as you can see, the genotypes don't change. It's exactly what we do if it were a regular dihybrid, right? We get a nine group with the double dominant, a three group recessive and one at least one dominant, the other three group, the other dominant, the other recessive, and then the big loser, right? But in this case, these two guys are the same phenotype. In this case, these guys are the yellow labs. This guy is the chocolate, right? And they call it brown and golden. These people are idiots. We all know it's a chocolate lab and a yellow lab. Brown and golden. <laughs> and then, of course, the nine, double dominant, is black. 
So what does this mean? Epistasis again means one gene's alleles masking another one. If this one looks like the double recessive big loser, that must mean any time we have the two little e's, regardless of what's going on at this other allele, it wins and they look yellow, right? Little b, little b doesn't matter because over here it's yellow, here it's chocolate because it's got the big E. If it's a big B and little E's, it's golden. If it's a little B's, little E's, it's golden. If it has one of each dominant, it looks black. That's recessive epistasis. These guys in the recessive form mask what's happening at this other allele. Again, two genes, one phenotype, coat color, but we call it recessive epistasis because remember, if it were just two genes, one phenotype, the one we talked about in the other lecture capture, we'd still get nine to three to three to one ratio, right? Did we get nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio? No, we got a four here. That's not nine to three to three to one, it's nine to three to four, right? Right. Okay. How does this work? How does recessive epistasis work? Well, in this case, the two genes contribute to the coat color in dogs because one is the actual pigment and the other is actually sticking the pigment into the hair shaft. Okay, so the pigment production is gene B, as shown here. Right, gene B is pigment, pig and gene E is sticking it into the shaft. <laughs> Getting the shaft. Okay. So if you're a 9 category, you have an active pigment. Yes, you make the dark pigment. And yes, you put it into the hair shaft. So look, you get black. Okay. So totally into the shaft. Looks great. You get a dark black lab. If you have no gene B or crappy pigment production, right? But you can incorporate some stuff into the hair shaft, right? You'll get this chocolate guy. So, right, this pigment isn't the only one incorporated. There's other pigments made elsewhere. So none of the black pigment gets added, but we make brown or chocolate pigment elsewhere, and that one can get incorporated because gene E is in charge of putting pigment into the shaft, right? If this other, we'll call this brown, whatever, gene C, okay? Here, it doesn't matter if gene C is also made, right? If we're putting the brown and the black in, it's still going to look black. There's really no difference between black and black with brown. They all look like a black lab, okay? If, in the case we make the black pigment, we have a capital B, but we can't incorporate it, you look yellow, right? That's the, the background, okay? So not really white, and, but yellow. Again, there's other genes and other pigments involved, so it's not like an albino, no pigment at all, but it, it's just the yellow working through another system, which we're not going to worry about. Again, if we have no black and then no incorporation, obviously you're still going to look yellow, okay? And so that's why recessive epistasis works in this case. So anytime there's a mutation, right, in the putting it into the follicles, you're not going to get brown and you're not going to get black. You have to have this guy incorporating to get any of the darker pigments. You have to have both black and incorporation to get black. If you only have incorporation, you get chocolate. That's recessive epistasis. What about dominance?